Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to have such a great turnout on a Friday afternoon when the weather is cooperating and there are many other things you could be doing in New York City, uh, but delighted you could join us. I'm Jenny McGill. I'm the Interim Director of the Economic and Political Development Concentration here at SIPA, and we're very excited to be able to welcome back uh, Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Mayaki, um, the Chief Executive Officer of NEPAD. Uh, uh, we have been delighted to host him for talks in the past, and his remarks are always illuminating and so I think at this critical juncture in the sustainable de development agenda, when we're looking at approaching the one-third target of, 20, of uh, 2020, it will really be helpful to us to get his perspective, um, especially um, on Africa and the opportunities for making progress on the sustainable development agenda in the continent. Uh, uh, so I'd like to first thank our co-sponsors, um, starting with NEPAD, um, our main co-sponsor, but also other co-sponsors here at Columbia. Um, we're also collaborating with the Center for Development Economics and Policy, um, the Institute for African American Stud or for African uh, Studies, um, SPAN, which is our student organization that is very focused on um, um, economic development and social and political development in Africa, um, the International Organization Specialization, and our own economic and political development. So. Uh, uh, I'll uh, first briefly introduce Dr. Mayaki, as well as uh, two of our faculty colleagues uh, from um, Columbia who are going to be providing some remarks on his, um, his um, uh, uh, statement. And then we'll be opening it up for um, discussion um, with you after all of them have spoken. Um, so a little bit of background on Dr. Mayaki, um, although I'm sure you know um, well, very well about his distinguished career. Uh, he was um, appointed to his position at NEPAD in 2009 um, after having served as Prime Minister of Niger from 1997 to 2000. Um, he has a master's degree from the National School of Public Administration, or ENAP, um, in Quebec, Canada, and a PhD in Administrative Sciences from the University of Paris. Um, and he has served as a professor of public administration in both Niger and Venezuela. Uh, he served previously as Minister uh, for African Integration and Cooperation and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Niger. He also set up the uh, Analysis Center for Public Policy in Senegal. And from 2000 to 2004, he was a guest uh, professor at the University of Paris. Um, he also led research at the Research Center on Europe and the contemporary world at that university. And he also served as executive director of the platform in support of rural development in West and Central Africa, the rural hub based in Dakar. Um, so a very distinguished career that I'm sure will um, um, will inform his remarks um, and perspectives here. I'd also like to briefly introduce our two commentators um, coming from the wider Columbia community. Um, first of all, a Professor Belinda Archibong, uh, who's a member of the economics faculty at Barnard College. Her research areas include development economics, political economy, economic history, and environmental economics with a particular focus on Africa. Some of her current research studies the impact of climate-induced health shocks on the gender gap in human capital investment and the impact of air pollution from glass flaring on human capital outcomes. Um, other work she has done, um, look at the links between domestic labor coercion, fiscal policy, and public infrastructure construction in British colonial Africa, the effects of taxation on public service provision in, the, in Nigeria, and the role of ethnic and gender bias in hiring. Um, she's also an affiliate with a number of other parts of Columbia, including the Center for Development Economics and Policy, the Earth Institute, Institute of African Studies, Institute for Research in African American Studies, and the Columbia Population Research Center, and her PhD is in sustainable development from Columbia. And um, our own Professor Akbar Noman, who is um, on uh, the faculty at SIPA, is also an economist with wide-ranging experience in policy analysis and formulation in a variety of developing and transition economies, and have worked extensively prior to joining Columbia, um, extensively for the World Bank, as well as other international organizations and at senior levels of government. Um, he combines teaching at SIPA with serving as a senior fellow at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, a think tank set up originally by Joseph Stiglitz here at Columbia and advising 
um, a number of governments in the developing and emerging world on policy matters. Um, and other ac academic appointments he's held are at Oxford and at the Institute of Development Studies at University of Sussex. So with that, um, I would invite Dr. Mayaki to share his remarks with us, and then we'll hear from our commentators and then open it up for a wider discussion uh, with you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Professor McGill, and uh, I would like to start by thanking SIPA for, for uh, hosting us here. And um, I, I think it's the third time in four or five years, and it's always a, a pleasure to, uh, to, to be here. So I'm really delighted. And uh, the subject we are going to discuss about is rethinking development. Um, it's a subject on which I've been uh, um, working for quite a, a long time now. Uh, uh, let me set the, uh, the, the picture and the reasons for which we, uh, we think as uh, within NEPAD that uh, this issue is a critical one. Uh, we act as the implementing agency of the African Union and um, we are supposed to implement on the ground, nationally and regionally, uh, the strategic frameworks that are being designed by the African Union. Uh, strategic frameworks in agriculture, infrastructure, industrialization, uh, skills development, etc. So we uh, are delivering uh, uh, on the ground uh, policies, uh, mechanisms, uh, processes, and uh, the more we have been in contact with the ground in the last, and when I say the ground, I'm referring to national context and regional context, uh, the more we deliver, uh, the more we sense that uh, the rationale of our delivery uh, can be questioned in, uh, in, uh, in many aspects. Uh, when you think about agricultural transformation, uh, as you all know, you have uh, usual factors of uh, increasing productivity, uh, uh, improving seeds, um, uh, the issues of access to markets, uh, rural infrastructure, empowerment of small-scale farmers, all these things are known. Uh, when you talk about infrastructure development, well, you know, but project feasibility studies are important. Project development is important. Uh, uh, the steps that lead you to a financial close regarding an infrastructure project are quite well known. So the, the technical solutions to what we call development are quite well known. Uh, in education, well, uh, Globally, uh, technically, you know what has to be done in relation to primary education, to secondary, tertiary education. Um, we know what are the technical solutions for TVET, uh, uh, technical and vocational training, etc. And these technical solutions are the ones on which all development partners uh, do uh, uh, act. But uh, amidst that volume of technical solutions, we still are facing challenges in really attaining the goals that we are aiming at. And um, when we talk about sustainable development goals, as you know, we fundamentally, the agenda of the sustainable development goals is uh, different from the millennium development goals in the sense that it puts uh, the emphasis on the interlinkages between sectors. So it's the interconnectedness between sectors and goals that makes the main difference between the MDGs and the SDGs. Uh, uh, so as we move towards the implementation of the SDGs and the agenda that we have in the continent, within agenda, which is Agenda 2063, uh, we continue to face these uh, same constraints. Uh, we roughly know what the technical solutions are. Uh, we try to implement them, but uh, 
technical solutions per se are no longer uh, in able to allow us to deliver on what is supposed to be our development agenda. So the, the question which uh, comes out of that reflection is uh, should we continue thinking about development as it is defined uh, classically? Mm. Uh, so I, I will use a, a slide which I, I have and uh, um, uh, just one slide. I won't bother you with a PowerPoint. So we, uh, we, we did a, a study with Frederick Pardee Center and we looked at uh, uh, the scenarios of Africa's development in the context of what development means today. And uh, what we try to do is fundamentally uh, to reflect on critical transitions which are taking place within the continent. And there are four main transitions. Uh, I'll go very quickly through them. The demographic transition, which all of you know. Uh, currently, 50% uh, of the world's population under 18 years old is in Africa. And uh, given our current demographic growth rates, which are between 2.8 and 3.2, uh, not having finalized our demographic transition will double our population between now and 2050. So uh, this is a, a, a huge challenge, because if you take a, a, a country um, which has um, a 20 million inhabitants population, like Mali, with a demographic growth rate which is around 3.2, 3.3, 3.4. It means uh, that on the employment market in Mali, every year, you have courts of young evaluated at around 250,000 and 300,000 coming on the employment market. Uh, Mali has an incipient industry. 75% of its population lives in rural areas. And uh, the civil service in Mali can't hire 300,000 youngsters. And uh, the incipient industry can't hire 300,000 youngsters. Uh, so in the case of Mali, um, uh, the necessity to go through agricultural transformation and diversification of the rural economy uh, becomes a, a central issue in terms of policy. But uh, uh, um, what is uh, critical about this demographic transition is the acceleration process. Given the fact that it is an accelerating process, uh, the definition and the design of the policies to respond to that acceleration uh, becomes uh, really uh, 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 problematic. So the, the demographic transition is a critical transition which we need to, uh, to, to tackle and which sets uh, the context of our policy design <laughs> processes. The, the second uh, transformation is the human development and inequality uh, uh, transformation. Uh, as you know, um, Africa is one of the most unequal regions in the world. Uh, even if, in relative terms, we have reduced uh, uh, poverty, in absolute terms, the numbers of poor have, uh, have increased quite significantly. Uh, progresses have been made in health, education, uh, uh, um, etc. But uh, we still have uh, one of the largest uh, population in terms of proportion of poor in 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 in, uh, in in the world. So, if you link uh, the demographic uh, challenge with the inequality challenge, you have an equation uh, which is a critical equation for, for policy makers. The third uh, uh, transition through which we are going is the technological trans uh, transition. Uh, a, a country like Somalia has uh, the highest density of cell phones in the continent. And uh, you know that Somalia is a fragile country, which is in, uh, in, in the context of uh, 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 guerrilla warfare. But uh, it's interesting to see that they have, in Africa, 
the highest density of cell phones, higher than uh, Egypt, uh, South Africa, or, or Kenya. So uh, I'm just giving this example to show that the technological transition uh, is uh, uh, um, has an impact throughout the continent. Uh, one billion SIM cards uh, for one billion two hundred thousand inhabitants. Uh, um, a very important access to social media, which uh, uh, sets a context of connectivity. So uh, youngsters in South Africa know exactly what is happening in Kenya or in Sudan, and they, uh, the fact that they are able to connect uh, uh, creates a, 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 a social dimension which uh, governments uh, um, didn't use uh, to face um, 15, 20, 25 years, 25 years ago. The, the third transition is the uh, natural resources governance transition. And uh, fundamentally, it has to do with the impact of uh, climate change on uh, critical issues, uh, notably uh, our uh, agricultural systems. Uh, we import in the continent for about $35 billion of uh, agricultural products. Uh, we have increased the yields, but not sufficiently. And the issue of food security uh, will be a, a critical dimension in terms of uh, 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 the design of the policies that can allow us to, to, to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce uh, poverty. And uh, the other transition, which is an important transition, is the governance transition. Our governance systems uh, globally, from Sudan to Egypt to Algeria to Tunisia uh, to Zimbabwe, are transiting towards systems uh, of governance that we still uh, are uh, trying to figure out what they will be. Uh, and there is an important uncertainty uh, regarding that transition. But if we look at all these transitions, the major transition, the one which has the highest impact in terms of uh, uh, consequent policy design, is fundamentally the demographic transition. Uh, doubling its population between now and 2050 will have huge consequences in the governance systems of the continent. Uh, with a median age of 19 years old, you cannot govern societies which have a median age of 19 years old as societies which have a median age of over 40. Uh, why? Uh, because the uh, disconnect which exists between a youthful population with pressing demands and a, a public administration system which uh, uh, does not have a capacity to catch up with the demands, that gap uh, is a potential source of instability. So, these uh, uh, transitions will be critical in rethinking the way we design policies, not only in terms of content, but also in terms of process, how we, how we uh, design them. So that leads me to the, 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 the second uh, question I would like to enhance, which is uh, the issue of governance. I am convinced of the fact that uh, uh, the current African governments do not have the power to change their societies. It's, it's a bit strange coming from a former prime minister, <laughs> but it's uh, 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 why don't they have the capacity to, to change? Because of the way they grasp these transitions, and because of the fact that 75% of the population being under 25, uh, the lack of connection with organized groups of youth uh, uh, makes it uh, um, uh, problematic 
to really respond adequately uh, to the challenges that we are facing. Let me give you the case of Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia was an exemplary model in development. It was praised by the World Bank, by the IMF, the African Development Bank. Why? Because Tunisia had the highest penetration of IT in the continent. Tunisia had the highest literacy rate of girls in the continent. Tunisia had a very good agricultural production, which they could export to Europe. Tunisia had good ports, good airports, and the infrastructure was not that bad. So uh, Tunisia was on the path to development and was a, a model of what development was meaning. And as you all know, Tunisia imploded. It imploded uh, because, well, there are still discussions which are being held. Did it implode because of the quality of the governance system? Did it implode because of the dictatorship of uh, 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 Ben Ali? Uh, did, it implode, did it implode because of the high levels of unemployment? There are still discussions which are being held. But uh, uh, the issue is that well, a model of developed uh, country, quote and unquote, within the continent did fail and did implode. So we must ask uh, the, uh, the question, why did it happen? And I think it happened because uh, uh, the perception that the youth had of the governance uh, systems in Tunisia uh, was uh, uh, a very negative perception amidst the good indicators that we all know regarding what development is and, uh, and should be. So Tunisia uh, gives us a, a hint of what could happen in other African countries. So it's not enough to have the highest literacy rate of girls. It's not enough to have the highest uh, uh, IT um, internet penetration. Uh, all these indicators are really not enough uh, to have gender parity because Tunisia had the the indicators in terms of gender parity, which were among the best in the continent. It's not enough. Uh, uh, these transitions I'm talking about, and the demographic transition, makes it extremely hard to sell a development model based on these indicators and uh, uh, produce an ownership by fundamentally uh, uh, a youthful population. So you have governance systems which do not have power. Uh, they think that they have power, and they think that having succeeded in uh, reaching these objectives and these indicators, they have been able to deliver on a development agenda, but uh, uh, the perception that the majority of the population have of the delivery on that agenda is a negative one, is not a positive one. So we, we have an issue there, which is, uh, um, quite uh, uh, critical for all of us as, uh, as, as policy makers. So my, my take is that the power relationships, given the demographic transitions, have changed enormously. So we have governments who think they have power, and in reality they don't have power to change their societies. <laughs> And if they don't have power to change the societies, it means that their go the governance systems are inadequate. And if they are inadequate, how can they be changed? And evidently, if they are perceived as inadequate, they cannot be changed in a top-down manner because it would be a replication of the same rationale which led to uh, what we are uh, uh, facing uh, uh, today. So my conviction uh, is that uh, uh, there is a, a shift of power from centralized uh, 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 governments uh, to uh, local governments, uh, local communities, and to fundamentally uh, uh, the youthful uh, uh, population. 
If we look at uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Cameroon, south of Niger, and Chad, uh, the median age of a Boko Haram fighter is 16 years old. Um, UNDP tells us that he earns more than $3 a day, and uh, he has a Kalashnikov, and he lives in a territory which has been neglected uh, in terms of quote-unquote uh, uh, development. So as uh, uh, we uh, rediscover uh, uh, the, uh, the limits of the development model that we have, we face more and more cases like, uh, like, uh, like these ones. And let me insist on, 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 on the governance issue one and take two examples uh, to which I like to, to refer to. One is uh, Central African Republic and uh, Botswana. Both countries are quite uh, uh, similar, uh, uh, not totally similar, but quite similar in terms of size, in terms of density of mineral resources. Uh, they didn't come to independence at the same time, but roughly at the same time. And uh, when both came at independence, they had a GDP per capita of $400. Uh, Botswana has multiplied its GDP per capita by 20. It's $8,000, roughly. And Central African Republic has divided its GDP per capita by two. It's around $200. Uh, so these two countries are in the same continent, inhabited by the same Africans, but with two radically different trajectories. Uh, I would not insist on the governance systems of, Bots of Botswana, but uh, one critical issue which uh, uh, makes uh, uh, Botswana uh, uh, original, quote-unquote, is the fact that uh, policy design and policy implementation as an inclusiveness dimension, which evidently Central African Republic doesn't have. So in terms of governance systems, you can classify uh, uh, most of African countries in two categories, those who try to look like Botswana and those who try to look like Central African Republic. So the more we will have uh, countries with governance systems looking like Botswana, the more Africa will invent its uh, uh, development pathway with a, a, a critical emphasis on inclusivity. And uh, if Botswana, with roughly the same good indicators as Tunisia, if Botswana uh, uh, succeeded in uh, not imploding, but uh, reaffirming the quality of its uh, uh, political systems, which uh, Tunisia couldn't with the same indicators, is fundamentally, in my view, because Botswana had the important dimension uh, of inclusivity regarding its governance systems and regarding its policy design and implementation processes. So, uh, Classifying African countries according to how much they look like Botswana or how much they look like uh, 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 Central African Republic can be interesting because it allows you to see if inclusivity uh, uh, plays a role or doesn't play a role and how much does inclusivity play a role, an important role uh, or not. So. If we take the case of the government of Botswana, we can consider that it has the power to change because inclusivity is a main uh, trait of its governance system. And if we take the case of Central African Republic, unfortunately, uh, uh, we have a government which doesn't have power to change almost anything. So uh, whatever we do in terms of uh, uh, quality of development policies in Central African Republic, if we succeed to get to a Tunisian uh, exemplary model, it won't uh, uh, take away, evidently, uh, that uh, uh, possibility 
of uh, implosion. So realizing that uh, power relationships have changed, realizing that within a, a, a youthful uh, uh, population, inclusivity is an absolute condition for sustainability, uh, makes uh, 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 the issue of thinking about development radically different from what we used to, uh, uh, to were used to uh, 30, 40, uh, 50 years ago. So this is the, 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 uh, the Africa we, we are facing, uh, critical transitions, uh, changing governance systems, uh, and changing power relationships, and the questioning of the quality of uh, the development policies that we have, whether in terms of content or in terms of uh, uh, design uh, uh, process. So my, my third point is about the, the global uh, uncertainties that we are facing uh, today. Um, aid was an important component of our development policies uh, for quite a long time. Uh, aid will disappear in the next 10 years, and it is already disappearing if we look at the DAC OECD numbers. And uh, when it is not disappearing, it is being transformed uh, in, in uh, uh, military support. Uh, uh, we see it, for example, in the Sahel region in, in West Africa. Most of the ODA which is provided to the Sahel region is linked to military objectives. So it's no longer the ODA we were used to, focused on education, focused on health, etc. It's uh, militarily, it's, uh, uh, excuse my English sometimes because I, I'm not an English speaker, huh? but uh, so I, when, when I make mistake, uh, uh, please uh, uh, um, um, uh, be, uh, 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 Tolerant. So the, uh, the, the, the ODA is disappearing. Uh, the role of the uh, multilateral system, uh, as you know, is being questioned uh, and is being questioned by very heavy actors uh, who do not believe in uh, the multilateral system. Uh, so the global uncertainty we are facing is uh, a dying ODA, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, we'll talk about it later. Uh, a multilateral system which is trying to find its way uh, and being questioned by uh, critical multilateral actors. Uh, an agenda on sustainable development goals, which normally is a universal agenda, which should be implemented uh, by New Zealand, Australia, Malawi, and the United States of America. Uh, but this, uh, if we look at the, uh, the attainment of the goals of the SDGs according to the various evaluation reports that we have, uh, we are lagging behind. And we have started to lag behind in a more accelerated manner than in the implementation of the MDGs. So we have this global uncertainty. Uh, trade issues are becoming quite complicated. Uh, and we are shifting from a uh, rules-based multilateralism uh, to uh, regional uh, uh, powerhouses. And this is why in that global uncertainty, Africa is recentering itself on an internal agenda. And that's mainly the reason for which, for example, we have uh, uh, decided to uh, create the uh, African uh, Free Trade Agreement uh, in order to move towards a, a, a free trade area. Uh, it will take time. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, efforts that will need to be done. A lot of harmonization processes will need to be developed. Uh, it will be a difficult pathway, but it's a resolute uh, determination that we have to move towards a free trade area. Because we are convinced of the fact that in this global uncertainty, uh, rethinking development means 
looking at our regional internal markets. And it's within our regional internal markets that uh, we will be able uh, to have a learning curve in terms of competitiveness and then be able to play a certain role in uh, uh, a globalized world with high levels of uncertainty. So in that global uncertainty, uh, we tend to rethink uh, the terms of our internal uh, uh, equation of development and uh, uh, move away from the rationale which was uh, imposed uh, by, uh, imposed, no, but which was linked uh, to, uh, uh, to ODA. And uh, uh, this is uh, a good news uh, uh, for the continent because it will uh, push towards uh, a, 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 an objective that we have been pursuing since the 60s, which has to do with regional integration. Uh, one of the main obstacles to Africa's development is fragmentation. 55 countries uh, um, uh, cannot have each one of them, their industrial policy, their agricultural policy, their energy policies in an efficient manner because of issues of scales and uh, uh, all the other issues that you perfectly know. So regional solutions are really uh, uh, the main solutions towards which we should move. Regional meaning at, in our regional gathering in West, Central, South and East Africa. Uh, national solutions are no longer optimal solution. Optimality is at the regional level, whether it is in education, in energy, transport, etc. So uh, this is the fact of having a continental, pushing towards a continental free trade area. Uh, strengthening internal regional markets, looking at regional solutions in the policy domains we are acting in. This uh, uh, process is a good news because it will have an impact on the role governments play. And uh, uh, remember, uh, uh, the fact of not having power uh, uh, limits uh, their ability to change. So the fact that uh, we uh, are pushing them towards inserting themselves in regional solutions will somehow restore credibility uh, to national governments because most of what they will have to do will need to be linked to these, uh, to these regional solutions. And in that context of global uncertainty, uh, this is the way uh, uh, towards which uh, Africa should go. So now, uh, having looked at the, the, the transitions, the issues of governance and the issues of global uncertainty, uh, let me say just two words on the African uncertainties. Uh, between, in the next five, six, seven years, 90% uh, uh, of the current African heads of states who are uh, seated as heads of states uh, will disappear mathematically uh, uh, for, uh, we don't have time to go into the reasons, but uh, believe me, uh, they, uh, they, so a new, a new leadership will emerge in, in the next uh, seven, six, seven, eight years. And we don't know what will, what will this leadership be. Uh, but we know for sure that with an intensification of democratization processes, uh, these leaders will certainly emerge, for the most part, out of uh, democratic processes. So, and uh, the youth will have a very important role to play in shaping that new leadership. So, uh, this is an uncertainty. Uh, will, uh, will they be leaders that emerge through populist processes? Uh, with uh, messages which are uh, too easy to understand, so uh, very attractive, uh, with populist solutions? Uh, will they emerge uh, 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 from a dynamics of uh, profound reflection internally? Uh, will they emerge uh, out of uh, uh, 
uh, an increased level of conflictuality? We don't know. This is an uncertainty. Uh, uh, the, the only thing we can say is that if we uh, count on the fact that a youthful population has a clear idea of its demands, uh, we can assume reasonably that they will do the best they can uh, to try to choose leaders who are able to respond to these demands. But this is an uncertainty, and we'll have to face that, uh, that uncertainty. What is one of the factors that can allow us to manage that uncertainty is, once again, the regional solutions. Because if regional blocs uh, tend to gain more power than they have today, they can shape what will be the leadership at the leaderships at national level. So it's a bet, uh, but we still have we have that, uh, that uncertainty. So the, uh, these different factors lead us to a, a, a reflection on what development. Uh, uh, how we see development today. Uh, is it the development which is linked to the SDGs, which I call a classical development? If you add the interconnectivity between the goals and you add uh, the environmental issues, roughly, in my sense, it's a, it's a classical way of thinking about development. Uh, uh, so. Should we go towards that? Uh, well, it's not even should we go. Uh, will that uh, uh, path, uh, process, and approach prevail over the others? Uh, what we know is that if we look at uh, uh, the development industry, um, call it the development industry, it is facing uh, radical uh, 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 a radical questioning uh, by local actors uh, uh, from north to south to east uh, uh, to, to Central Africa. And the, the tandem which uh, did uh, exist between donors, partners, and governments, this tandem has a low level of credibility in terms of delivery uh, by uh, a youthful population which uh, 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 questions the way the delivery on the development, classical development agenda has been done. And uh, think about Tunisia. Uh, and so when we rethink development, uh, the, the critical issue will have to do with inclusivity. So, and inclusivity uh, uh, is a is not a vague concept. Inclusivity can be uh, uh, materially reflected in uh, uh, certain type of processes. Uh, the way we have been designing our education policies, health policies, etc., uh, in a top-down manner, that way is no longer uh, acceptable by the majority of the population. Uh, uh, so inclusivity in that case means that public policies need to be co-produced because uh, the role of the experts has been questioned. The role of the governments has been questioned. Expertise is important, but remember, technical solutions are quite well known. What is lacking fundamentally are the political solutions which can help technical solutions to be effective. And for that to happen, the governance systems need to be reviewed and uh, inclusivity has to be at the core of the, of the, of the governance systems. So this is the, the, the change of paradigm towards which uh, we should go if we want to uh, uh, stabilize three things. Uh, first of all, uh, stabilize the demands of the youth. Uh, we have an agenda which is called Agenda 2063, uh, which we all believe in, but uh, what many of the youth are saying is that we can't wait 2063. Uh, we have expectations right now. So the best way to have them be part of this agenda 
is also to have um, be a part of the design process of a public policies. The, the second uh, domain which will uh, it will help to uh, uh, to, to to stabilize is uh, uh, the uh, I'm coming back again on that uh, the governance systems uh, looking in a much more in a bottom-up manner than in a top-down manner. So I, my uh, uh, thinking is that Africa will need to reinvent governance systems uh, which have not been uh, uh, existing yet. And these governance systems will need to give a place to two fundamental dimensions, the local dimension, which is empowering local communities, and what I'm saying is not new. It has already been said, but it has been uh, rarely implemented. And uh, the other dimension which will lead to a positive change is the regional dimension. The more we'll move towards regional solutions, uh, the better we'll be able to redefine the role of the state, the role of the government, and push towards, uh, towards uh, 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 inclusivity. So, if we, uh, how long have I spoken? <laughs> huh? I'm okay? Okay, good. So if we go back to um, um, uh, Central African Republic and, and Botswana, um, $8,000 per capita, uh, it's not because of the export of diamonds, because many of our African countries do export raw materials. Uh, without having that uh, uh, quality of, uh, of governance. So if we go back to the example of Botswana and the example of Central African Republic, uh, the lesson we need to draw is that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, leadership matters. Uh, secondly, uh, governance matters, and this is not new, evidently. But uh, fundamentally, uh, the way uh, uh, people identify with a development policy in the sense that they feel that their dignity is, uh, is preserved is the most important aspect. Uh, when I was prime minister in, in 1998, uh, uh, we did a survey in, uh, in Niger. Uh, we were uh, starting a, a, a planning process. We were going to design a three-year plan. Uh, and uh, uh, we decided not to delegate that fundamentally to the experts to think about what we should do in terms of education, et cetera, macroeconomic stability, and so on. So we said, let's, uh, let's find out what are the populations thinking about the priorities of development. So, and we started somehow, betting is not the term, but trying to, to guess what they would say. It was a, a survey uh, which was done, government of Niger and uh, uh, government of Canada. It took about seven months uh, all over the country. And uh, so we are waiting for a list of priorities. Uh, uh, we were supposing that in the east of Niger, they would say, well, Water is a priority, uh, and in the center of Niger, I would say uh, agricultural production is a priority. In the east of Niger, we would say land issues is a priority. So guess what? Uh, the priority which came uh, 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 first as a priority in all the regions, all the regions uh, confounded, uh, was not water, was not education, was not infrastructure. It was justice. So uh, rethinking development means also uh, rethinking what justice is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayaki. Well, um, uh, you have given us a lot to, to think about, reflect on. Thank you for challenging us and some of our assumptions um, about what development means, um, and also for your um, emphasis on the importance of looking at 
the youth population of Africa as the future and also as the drivers of, of change. Uh, looking at the population of this room, I would say the median age here, it's not 60, it's maybe not 19, but we definitely have a number of people in the room who I'm sure really would respond to your emphasis on um, considering youth as the, as, uh, the important factor to consider in uh, driving um, policy and progress forward in Africa. So with this, I'd like to um, ask our two um, commentators, uh, Dr. Archibong and Dr. Noman, to come up. And uh, Dr. Mayaki, I don't know if you mind being in the center of things, um, uh, but um, we will really benefit from their perspectives um, and, and response to your remarks as well. Uh, and perhaps uh, I could ask Dr. Archibong to comment first. And I should note here um, that <clears throat> Uh, another um, event uh, earlier today um, also drew on Dr. Archibong's uh, perspective as a commentator, so we're delighted she could double bill and also um, join us for this event. So, Dr. Archibong. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you, Dr. Mayaki, for the thank wonderful you. comments oh, as well. Oh, mic. sorry. We're just your steal your mic for a minute here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Mayaki, for the, for the excellent comments as well. Um, so I will, I will just give some very brief comments, my thoughts on, on you know, the, the issues you've raised so far and the questions that I think I'm thinking of and I hope we also all think of as well here. Uh, so, so you outlined very nicely a kind of uh, history of development policy in Africa and, and, and how um, you know, we, we've had kind of these costly uh, you know, in your previous comments, you had like the structural adjustment programs, referrals to that, and we are, we are currently kind of un undergoing a number of transitions, right? So you mentioned there's a demographic transition that we're facing, uh, transitions related to human capital development and inequality and a technological transition, um, and, and also a governance tr a transition, which, you know, is something that we will have to think about going forward. Um, and, and then you really highlighted this case for the need for coordinated effort uh, with, between countries within Africa, so reg more regional integration, more regional cooperation, harmonizing policies around uh, environment, uh, environmental policy, financial regulation, uh, and all of these things as being very important for, for development outcomes. And, and I, I like the, the Botswana, you know, I was trying to think of how do we become more like Botswana and less like CAR, but then I started thinking about can you come from CAR to Botswana, and then what if Tunisia happens? Anyway, it was all very interesting. <laughs> this is like, a, you know, try to put, put these things together. Um, and then making this, new, this, this case for a, a new government system that highlights the fact that we don't need to depend on ODA, right? And we, we really can gain from trade between African nations with a nice regional integration model. Uh, and basically this, with this point that Africans have the agency to act and, and to, to move on you know, African development. Um, so I'll, I'll have some kind of three brief comments really around this, this idea of the ability of Africans to act and the you know, African agency, and particularly around one, coordination within countries. So how do we think about relationships between people and especially young people and their governments? And then how it's related to this, this point about inclusivity that you mentioned. Um, two, thinking about coordination, relationships between uh, across governments and across people within Africa, so regional integration that you mentioned and regional coordination. How do we promote regional coordination? What are the challenges that we face when thinking about how do we promote regional, uh, regional integration and regional coordination? And then three, thinking about, you know, should we, I know you, you, you kind of said maybe we should, we're moving away from thinking about what African countries should do relative to the other global community outside of Africa. Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know, should we think about that a little bit further as well as we mm -hmm. think about what do we do for the future of African development mm -hmm. or do we just kind of step back from, from that and focus mm -hmm. inward within the region. So on the first comments um, about kind of coordinating efforts within countries, right? So looking at relationships between people and their government. Um, so, so I thought it was very interesting you mentioned that African you know, African countries do not have the power to change the co their countries as, as you know, somebody you've been in government and you said that you did not think that these top-down approaches were really the way to go and it's, it's more of a bottom-up approach to development that will really spur economic growth in the region. Uh, and so one of the things that you mentioned regarding how this bottom-up process would work is around um, young people especially, right, who make up a large bulk, you know, of many nations in Africa and will going forward as well with the, demo uh, you know, the demographics looking as they are, um, how to kind of involve that population 
to be more civically and politically engaged within countries, right? So if you look at the statistics around mm. civic and political engagement in Africa, people mm. who are more likely to vote, participate in democratic um, uh, policy, uh, rallies, things like that, it is not the young population, mm. right? So they're not engaging um, politically, they're not engaging, you know, kind of civically within communities to the extent that you, you would need to get this kind of inclusive um, development, this kind of involvement of youth to change policies within their countries, right? And so, so the question then is, is how do we do that? And, and no one, and I always think it's very interesting, you know, I'm, I'm from Nigeria, growing up in Nigeria, it was, it was kind of dual, dual messages that you hear. So on the one hand, people say, the youth are the future, and it's very important for development. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's like, shut up and don't talk when your adults are speaking. You know, so it's a, it's a very, you know, yeah. well, but you just said we were the future. I guess how far in the future do we need to look for this to happen, you know? Yeah. It's like when you're, when you're 70, when yeah. is the future? Um, and, and so I think, and, and this is something that you've been like, you know, our Nigerian politicians have said this, like our president was like, they, our youth are lazy. Mm -hmm. Our vice president explicitly made this comment about, yeah. well, you shouldn't even try and be involved in, in politics at a higher level if you're young mm -hmm. until you've put in your kind of hours, and mm -hmm. I guess when you are his age and older. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so then, you know, thinking about these gaps, you know, where the young are not involved politically, they're not involved in the political system, and also the older generation has this cultural kind of context where they, they seem to promote that, right? So mm -hmm. there's people give a lot of lip service again to youth are our future, mm -hmm. but then on, in, on the, in practice, it's yeah. like, no, we don't actually want the youth to be involved. Mm -hmm. So how do we change that kind of cultural and I don't know if this is a cultural thing or, an, or a more kind of formal institutional thing, but how do we change this shift so that we can close this, gen this uh, uh, kind of youth gap in political engagement and have the youth more involved in these policies that you're saying that we need, right, to have this bottom-up approach, to have these more inclusive um, policies for, for, for development in Africa to happen. So, so kind of that, that was that's kind of my first point thinking about that. Um, uh, uh, well, I, I already gave you the Botswana, uh, CAR, Tunisia, you know, kind of how do we reduce the risk? First of all, can a, can a CAR, you know, become a Botswana? I know this is more theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, how does a Botswana prevent or reduce the risk of becoming a Tunisia, right? So thinking about um, all of these as well in a kind of practical sense. Um, my second comments were, as I mentioned, about looking at coordination across countries in Africa. And this idea of regional integration that you mentioned as being important, so important for economic development. Um, and, and you mentioned this demographic transition. You, you know, there's, there's a lot, there are lots of, of, of young people, especially, that are migrating. Um, some of it is from climate pressure, so migration is expected to rise in the future. Um, and I wonder how, or if you think that this is something to be concerned about, mm -hmm. um, especially within the context of intergroup conflict, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you guys heard about the South Africa, Nigeria debacle, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this is something that people are saying, you know, well, we, we maybe we want to increase the barriers to entry within Africa from mm -hmm. other African countries because we don't want all these people coming, you know, mm -hmm. in South Africa, this was a story, we don't want all these Nigerians coming in and mm -hmm. they take the jobs and they, you know, this is the usual story about immigrants, but they take the jobs, they, they put pressure on the social services, etc. Uh, and so kind of knowing that we need this regional, regional coordination and regional integration is necessary for, for our development, how do you kind of address these, these types of intergroup conflicts that arise with things like migration, right? So thinking about that and thinking about maybe how that affects um, broader macro policy around coordinating monetary policy within Africa, right? So. I don't know if you heard about the, the ECHO. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to be very echo excited echo. about that. Mm -hmm. The, the ECHO as joint currency. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, you think it's maybe coming to more policies like that, but then we still have this underlying tension with, you know, intergroup conflicts and how that might affect future policy or the willingness to engage in regional integration if Nigeria and South Africa are fighting in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking about how, how to address these types of issues. Um, and then my final point about Challenges to coordination with the rest of the global community. And again, this is, you know, you, 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 you didn't uh, mention this as much because we said focus on the regional integration, which is fantastic. Um, but I just came, uh, I, as was said, I just came from a talk um, where the World Bank, they're talking about global value chains, right? So this is the, we're studying global value chains. We think it's, it's going to be great. There are all these gains from specialization and it's going to be great for poor countries because they will have access to more jobs and 
hopefully that will lead to higher wages and this will be good because it will raise countries out of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, given the discussion about, you know, you, you mentioned we don't know what's going to happen with trade wars in the future. There could be um, maybe increased barriers to free trade. But on the other hand, you know, many international organizations, or at least the World Bank, is telling us that GVC is the way to go. Global value chains are the way to go. So, so do you think that we should be Africans and, and African countries, African governments, should be more involved then in trying to integrate into these global value chains, or is this something where you think, you know, we should kind of focus on 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 getting that integration within the continent across African countries? Um, and of course, there are all these, these issues, again, that, that then are, are, are arise, not just in, in terms of trading with the global community, but between African countries in terms of bargaining mm -hmm. power, right? Mm -hmm. So, so con some countries have more bargaining power than others. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of affects maybe their willingness to, to engage in um, trade or joint policy, right? Because people are saying, you know, we might have, I might be the loser in this relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of how do we then provide the incentive structure, provide the environment where people look at these challenges but say, you know, we, we are still willing to, to have within Africa regional integration and then maybe we also want to think about, you know, integrating into the larger global community um, as well. Or we don't. So anyway, these are my comments. Thank you very much no, again. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I think I will leave that. Uh, I've been told only one mic is working, so I think I will leave the back. Thank you very much. Um, well, it was a very wide-ranging talk, and uh, much of it was above my head, um, because I don't know I can claim to fully understand the political dynamics mm -hmm. in African countries. I'm not going to go there, and all those set of political issues you raised, essentially issues of governance and so on. Let me make... Um, few comments. I thought it was really interesting that you highlighted these transitions or challenges, if you like, that Africa is facing. The world is changing. Of course, it always changes. That's one thing is constant uh, in this world. Change and uh, things are changing in some ways in a very rapid and fairly profound way with important implications. One of the things you emphasized was the demographic transition, of course. And that is really crucial in many ways to how things work out, including the the political implications that you emphasize of youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. So what do you have? You have a context in which, and this is a real challenge, Africa is aiming to transform, mm -hmm. it's undertake economic transformation in a context where there are all sorts of headwinds now appearing to the classical route of industrialization, development, and manufacturing. Share of manufa manufacturing has been the victim of its own success with productivity rising faster than demand and share of manufacturing declining almost everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. including in East Asia. Mm -hmm. Even in East Asia, there's been a decline in the share of manufacturing in GDP. Mm -hmm. So you have this headwind, this context, and, and <coughs> technological change where manufacturing's classical role that it played, say, in East Asian development now becomes very difficult. Yeah. And this is happening at a context, in a context of a demographic transition. Mm -hmm. So the traditional route of you know, increasing uh, employment in manufacturing as the way out becomes much more problematic now. Uh, now, what are some of these implications? What does it mean? So to me, actually, uh, and around it, of course, also for political purposes, the single most important issue in a sense in long term, there are two really. One is dealing with the uh, employment issue and that is climate change. This is the other thing mm -hmm. that you emphasize. What does it mean? Now, on the employment, as you know, I mean, as you pointed out, this, you, know, you have this enormous increase in population, but you have youth population in particular. But you have these projections of what's going to happen to the labor force. Mm -hmm. okay? And you have an increase in the world's labor force in the medium UN projection of 2.0 billion mm -hmm. between 2010 and 2100. Whereas Africa's increase will be 2.1 billion. Mm -hmm. That was more than 100% of the global increase. Mm -hmm. uh, share of world's labor force on these projections to rise from about 13% to about 41%. So mm -hmm. it's an enormous increase. As you, tell, as you point out, the, the restrictions on migration is becoming now much more difficult. I don't see 
for migration to developed countries, even within Africa, as, as Belinda Chiampong pointed out, Chiampong is becoming difficult. But internationally, it's become too toxic a political issue. Mm -hmm. So I think that outlet is narrowing and closing very rapidly for African youth to migrate. Um, so in this context, the generation of employment, and it's very much part of also your emphasis on inclusivity, on the emphasis on youth and, their, and the political implications of dealing with the youth bulge is the generation of employment. Mm -hmm. It becomes a critical issue. Now, of course, you have, uh, and we are just, actually, we have just launched a, a task force on this issue of employment and what it means is given the trends in technology, it's not just the manufacturing sector share declining, but you know, with this uh, robotics and, internet and, and IA and so forth, costs. The labor, cheap labor costs are becoming much less of an advantage than they mm -hmm. used to be. Yeah. And how rapidly <coughs> that window that will disappear and how quickly, you know, uh, what's the window and so on are open questions on which there's very little debate and agreement. Now, so the question then becomes central to a lot of the issues that you raise and talk about governance, involvement of youth, of, uh, of political stability and so forth. Uh, is, is, is this very important issue of how you generate. Now, this is not an easy answer to uh, how you generate employment uh, in, and what is needed to be done. What is clearly needed is a very profound kind of structural transformation, which includes the emphasis on modernization of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Modernization, which means agriculture, actually, much of modern agriculture is like industry in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like commercial exports, of flour is a great example, or even oranges and so on. They require a lot of processes which were traditionally s associated with industrialization and modernization. That becomes important, but then you say, as you point out, in that context, the regional uh, dimension of exploiting the regional market in Africa becomes also very important, which is particularly given the kind of uncertainties in the multilateral trading system. So that is, uh, now, how do you go about it? I won't have time to go into it at any length here. Um, of course, on, uh, on, uh, on, um, on the policies and the responses there, too. Um, I think you have to have, of course, uh, a, it's a very large and diverse region, as you pointed out, Africa. You have the Central African Republic and Botswana examples. But this was a period of economic decline that Africa went through over a period of during the 80s and early 90s, mm -hmm. and there's been a recovery since then. Actually, it was not just, uh, you mentioned in your notes that this led to this period of structural reform programs, led to an undermining and weakening of institutional and operational capabilities within African government. Um, it not only really did that, I think it did more than that. It also mm -hmm. kind of, in many ways, de-developed Africa. Mm -hmm. certainly a deindustrialization in Africa mm -hmm. that occurred during this period. And in fact, Africa became a kind of uh, experimental lab, if you like, or a exp grand experiment in what I th personally think were rather crude and vulgar uh, forms of the Washington Consensus policy that were in, uh, particularly in the 80s, but you know, which was, uh, uh, and a lot of people have done a mea culpa on that now, um, so that what you let, had is an outcome of falling per capita income for a long time, uh, and you had the Africa did not, the average per capita income in the region, sub-Saharan Africa, I'm talking to about mostly, did not recover to its peak level of about 1977 until about 25 years later in early 21st century. Because you had very impressive growth in the many, some countries, of course, it's a large and diverse. In particular, a lot of the countries, of course, have been natural resource-based growth, and that has problems of sustainability, and particularly, of course, when you're using up your non-renewable resources. But all, there are also been emerging some very promising African uh, in, in, uh, indigenous uh, efforts, uh, development, and articulated very clearly by leaders like, uh, like uh, Mele Zanavi and, um, and Kagame, Kagame. And so Ethiopia and Rwanda are two countries which achieved very rapid growth in this century mm -hmm. without not relying on natural resources. Mm -hmm. That's an important. And what they did is also a very interesting case. They very systematically sought to learn and adapt 
lessons of success elsewhere, including in Africa, including Africa's history in other African countries, but particularly in East Asian countries, what happened. As you know, um, Prime Minister Mellis has written on this extensively and has very uh, clearly articulated uh, an alternative strategies. Now, I think there are important lessons to be learned from this success of those African countries. Remarkable success, actually. I don't know how many people know if I were to ask the question in this room, uh, which was the economy which matched China's growth in the period from about 2005 to about 2018, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. There's only one economy mm -hmm. non amongst non-oil non is, is, is Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia has been growing at roughly the same rate for about you know, over a decade, you know, 12, 15 years. So that's an impressive uh, thing to emulate. Rwanda has done very well, very close to it. And again, these are people who have articulated an African alternative in a very clear and deliberate ma manner and have sought to, uh, and one of those things is that active use of what they call learning industrial and technology policies mm -hmm. for development. And of course, that becomes all the more important for generating employment when you do that and spreading that to uh, more sectors to agriculture. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of other issues that you've raised, which are, uh, uh, there's so many issues that you've raised. Your talk was so wide ranging, I can't possibly in any way do justice to some of uh, your. Um, to other. I just want to make one comment on the aid disappearing and the lack, and you, you welcome the lack of reliance on foreign aid, uh, which is you see coming happening. And that's, I think, absolutely right. But I think there's one very important issue on which Africa uh, deserves, needs, and is almost a moral imperative for the world, I think, to provide uh, vast amounts of foreign assistance, which is dealing with climate change, mm -hmm. which Africa has made no contribution to what's happening, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to, and is likely to reap very heavy costs. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a moral, ethical obligation of the international community to finance Africa's adaptation in large measure. Um, the whole set of issues around where, as you say, multilateralism is in decline and retreat in some form or the other, and part of that response to that is to, um, is to uh, have regional, in increasing regional integration and cooperation within Africa. But there are also a whole set of issues on which Africa's unity can help to change the rules of the game, mm -hmm. global rules which apply, right? And in particular, one thing is, as you know, going beyond the WTO, I mean, WTO had various conditions and restricted policy space, but going well beyond the WTO have been this series of bilateral trade and investment agreements that African countries have entered into uh, with various uh, you know, uh, donors and a part of a nexus of aid, investment, trade relationship. And so these are very complex agreements. Uh, and they allow for, amongst other things, they don't allow for renegotiation of, of corrupt or unequal or unfair uh, 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 treaties or, or agreements on extraction of resources, mm -hmm. yeah, what, how the profits are shared. And the inability, and most of these bilateral trade and investment agreements prohibit a renegotiation of any mm -hmm. of these treaties. Now, I think that is an, a united African front on that and on that uh, on not going into these kind of bilateral agreements and indeed I would argue for a united African front on undoing some of these bilateral agreements or much of them right and related to that is the whole set of issues which you alluded to elsewhere in your writings I know on this international which is, you didn't talk about today that much but you alluded to them is this whole set of issues around settlement of international settlement dispute resolution mechanism mm -hmm. and how they have been working against uh, African interest. That again is a, and then a, a very important point you talk about financing uh, of for Africa is the tax avoidance by multinationals, especially yep. in, in those engaged in natural resource exploitation in Africa, which is a kind of double whammy in a sense. And there's a lot of initiatives at the OECD right now to do something about these various ways in which um, uh, multinational tax avoidance operate. 
And again, I would hope that uh, United Africa and uh, the uh, uh, free trade area and AU would take up these issues, uh, which can't be dealt with at the individual country level. They just don't have the bargaining, negotiating power, or the technical expertise. A lot of these things are very technical uh, and, uh, on, on, and legalistic. So you require uh, an, uh, um, a very much uh, a united front. Um, I don't know if I, w I, I don't, I think I, I won't, I mean, you've you touched too many issues for any discussion to do any justice to them. They're, they're really interesting, mm -hmm. and I won't even try there. Uh, I think I will, um, I will, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of our discussants. Um, uh, Dr. Mayaki, we'd like to give you a, an opportunity to respond okay. to either or both Thank sets you. of uh, comments before we open it up for some questions from the rest of the room. No, f thank you. I, I would really like to thank both of you for um, these uh, extremely pertinent comments which uh, shed light on uh, some of the weaknesses of my presentation. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I thought they I highlighted humbly. the strengths of the <laughs> No, our strength also, but uh, 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 we're in an academic setting, so it's, uh, uh, it's okay. But now, on the issue of um, the cooperation between actors at national level, uh, I'll go back to the structural adjustment period uh, very quickly. And say, I'm not going into the details, but uh, the main purpose of the structural adjustment programs, as you all know, was to uh, uh, reorganize uh, the state in order to reimburse the debt. Uh, uh, so two critical factors did happen. First of all, uh, an absolute erosion of any strategic thinking in the long term. And secondly, uh, a, a, a design of uh, economic policies uh, geared towards uh, fundamentally uh, adjusting uh, state expenditures in order for debt to be reimbursed. So <coughs> among all the consequences that it had, uh, there are two which are, uh, for me, uh, quite important. Uh, we focused fundamentally on uh, uh, macroeconomic issues and um, on some sectoral issues. Uh, and you remember, uh, during that period of structural adjustment, uh, uh, we were told that uh, agricultural transformation was not a priority at all. Uh, uh, it, it took us a long time to come back you know, and reinsert uh, agricultural transformation into our development uh, agenda. So the, the other consequence was a, a, uh, our planning processes focused on macroeconomic issues, uh, some sectoral issues, and totally let aside the territorial dimension of development. So as um, we were adapting our planning processes, we forgot about the territorial dimension of planning. And the fact of having uh, put aside the territorial dimension of planning let uh, uh, immense parts of our territories uh, in a neglected uh, 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 situation. So uh, recreating uh, internal coordination processes means, among other things, reinserting the territorial dimension of planning in our systems. And this is what we are rediscovering uh, 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 more and more. Uh, we are rediscovering it in, in the Sahel region because of the conflicts which have risen. And we are rediscovering it in South Africa, for example, because of the uh, 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 manifestations which are taking place in uh, 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 local communities regarding the delivery on, on public services. Uh, so, uh, the first, the reinsertion of the territorial dimension in all our planning processes, our policy design, is absolutely uh, uh, fundamental. So, uh, added to that, uh, the, uh, a rebalancing 
of, uh, of the powers of central governments and local governments is absolutely uh, fundamental if we want to open a, a pathway to better coordination. Uh, thirdly, uh, I, 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 I think that um, you were referring to the fact that the, uh, the elite is quite old and then they, they, they tend to marginalize the youth, which is the truth in the policy processes. But uh, what is also happening is that their capacity to do so uh, will uh, slightly be erased by the increased capacity of the youth to organize itself. Uh, when I'm talking to uh, youth groups uh, in, in many, some countries in the continent, what I tell them, if you have a power that you ignore because you are not organized to exercise it. So, uh, and I think one of the role of, uh, of the state uh, would be to anticipate uh, any type of uh, uh, conflictuality by allowing uh, uh, youth groups to be organized and give them a space in the design of a, of a, of a public policies. I, I think that will be uh, uh, um, e extremely uh, e important. Uh, the other uh, question to which you alluded was the uh, the global uh, value chains, and uh, how can we uh, benefit of a global value chain? I, uh, Professor Norman wrote a book with Professor Stiglitz on industrialization, <laughs> and uh, uh, and how um, we can uh, we could be able uh, through uh, uh, a certain form of industrialization industrialization to tap into global value chains, but. Um, Danny Roderick says, forget about industrialization and jump to services. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, so, uh, uh, so, but uh, I, I, I firmly believe that uh, 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 it's through uh, uh, the creation of regional markets that will allow uh, manufacturing policies to be uh, efficient. And, uh, 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 it will be uh, one of the key factors that will allow us to tackle the challenges of unemployment. Uh, 20 million jobs to be created um, per year in the next 20 years is 400 million jobs. So uh, evidently, uh, uh, in uh, I, I look at Africa in you know in three uh, uh, dimensions. There is the Africa of uh, least uh, developed countries like uh, like mine, Niger or Mali. Uh, there is the Africa of uh, lower middle income countries uh, like Tanzania, and there is the Africa of the upper middle income countries. So these three Africas are, are have different dynamics, and uh, in a country like mine, Niger, where. 80% uh, of the population live in rural areas and their main activity is linked to agriculture. I mean, uh, structural transformation cannot take place without diversification of a rural economy. Uh, in a, a middle-income country like Kenya, where services are a, um, a, a high proportion of GDP, uh, uh, focusing on uh, 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 services in order to tackle uh, unemployment will be quite critical. So it, it, uh, according to um, where, we f where we fit, when the responses are, are different, but the common, uh, the common uh, uh, trait uh, that uh, um, should be enhanced, and I repeat again, is the, the, the regional uh, uh, dimension of the solutions we have. Because in most of our regional blocks, you have uh, two, a combination of these different Africas, whether it is in East or Central or, 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 or West Africa. So uh, I firmly believe in the fact that uh, we uh, 
uh, need to emphasize the role of locomotives, uh, uh, which have to put order in their, um, like Nigeria, huh? uh, uh, like Kenya, Rwanda, Ethiopia. Uh, these locomotives uh, will need to uh, really uh, trigger uh, a, a regional uh, uh, process uh, because they are doing much better than the other uh, countries in, in, in the region. So going back to the global value chains, uh, the, uh, if we uh, look at uh, the necessity to industrialize, uh, the fact of um, giving priority to light manufacturing, uh, as it is commonly accepted uh, uh, within our strategic frameworks uh, continentally. Uh, the fact of uh, uh, enhancing uh, regional markets, uh, these are the places where we learn our competitiveness. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, 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 um, inserting ourselves uh, in the uncertainty of a current global value chains uh, could be an advantage. Uh, uh, I, I don't have an answer to that, but it is an issue that has to be looked at, I think, uh, very, uh, very, very carefully. Um, I, I uh, fully agree with you, Professor, on the fact that uh, Ethiopia and Rwanda somehow uh, learned from East Asia that they needed to find their own development approach. Uh, they, they, they didn't mimic the content of the policies. Uh, you say mimic? Or, yeah. yeah? Uh, what they did was to mimic uh, uh, the, the design process. Uh, and that design process uh, resided fundamentally on uh, uh, Melissa. Now we had, you know, this sentence, uh, this expression. We need to make our own diagnosis and own it. If we own our own diagnosis, then we can own our own our solutions. And uh, uh, that's how they. I mean, they didn't follow the World Bank or the IMF. Uh, like uh, many East Asian countries did. They decided to design their own uh, strategy, uh, counting on their own uh, 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 weaknesses, uh, strength, and, and et cetera. And so, uh, for example, uh, in, in its industrialization process, uh, uh, from the start, uh, Ethiopia, and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, did put a, a strong emphasis on infrastructure development because they clearly uh, thought about uh, uh, the fact that if they didn't invest sufficiently in infrastructure, any industrialization policy would fail. Well, in a textbook it's evident, but when you negotiate uh, with multilateral donors, it's not always evident. So uh, the the option you take uh, on the basis of your own diagnosis and uh, if, when you impose your choice in a certain manner uh, uh, allows you uh, uh, to go through a process that you can really measure. And so your progress is not measured by an external donor. You are the one measuring your progress so you can you know, uh, rectify uh, uh, adequately. And uh, uh, what is remarkable in the case of Ethiopia, it's uh, even several years after uh, uh, um, Prime Minister Zenawi uh, passed away, uh, you still have you know, a continuity in, in, in the policies that have been carried. And uh, what is remarkable is that uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia uh, now has added to the economic agenda a political agenda of stabilization, uh, which is 
uh, complicated, but uh, which is uh, more and more owned by, by, by Ethiopians. So uh, we can see in that case that uh, uh, a, a, a relatively solid economic foundation also opened the door to a, a political stability, uh, uh, to a political transformation leading to, to stability. So Ethiopia is a, is, a, is, a, is a good example, which I, I, I think uh, um, should, inspire, should inspire us. Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, climate change and the fact that uh, you know, Africa doesn't contribute evidently to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to a greenhouse gases uh, 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 impact and uh, we, there, is a moral, uh, there is a moral imperative. Uh, the, the question now is, um, I, I fully agree with you. But uh, the, uh, is the moral imperative a, a priority of the global context in which we are? I, I, I wonder. I, I wonder. Uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, uh, worldwide there is a crisis of leadership. Um, I mean, uh, particularly if I can uh, uh, be a little bit politically incorrect, it seems to me that in the advanced uh, world, uh, there is a, 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 a weakening of a political leadership capacity uh, to make sure that this moral imperative is uh, taken into account. Uh, so the context in which we are, uh, um, those the context in which we are allow us to uh, transform this moral imperative into uh, an efficient solution, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, the Green Fund, which was supposed to be, as you know, uh, funded uh, Hundred billions a year on how many years? Uh, uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, the green fund is almost empty. Uh, so, uh, and the green fund was the main commitment of the international community uh, uh, in order to tackle uh, the impact of climate change. Uh, Africa will pay a very high price, uh, especially in terms of food security. Uh, uh, and uh, be, uh, not only will we pay a high price in terms of food security, uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but secondly, uh, as we industrialize, uh, we will at the same time need to green the industrialization process, uh, which is something which has not really uh, fully been done before. So uh, uh, technological innovation in greening our industrialization process becomes also a challenge. Mm. And, uh, and, and the expertise to do that will, uh, will absolutely need to be, uh, to be constructed. So pursuing that way uh, and looking at the financing of these processes, uh, I think will be uh, absolutely, absolutely critical. Because uh, um, the, uh, uh, the climate change, the African climate change issues are not Africans, they are global. Uh, uh, so the way Africa will deal uh, with uh, uh, climate change adaptation and ultimately mitigation, etc., will have uh, 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 positively or negatively an impact on the world. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's, it is a moral imperative, but it is also an economic imperative for the rest of the world. O on the issue of uh, migration, um, most of the, as you rightly said, most of the migration in the continent is internal. I mean, migration outside of Africa is really insignificant. 
uh, it tends to be uh, in, um, uh, exaggerated, but uh, essentially uh, migration is, is internal. And uh, uh, our hope is that uh, with uh, the construction of a free trade area, uh, it, it will enhance uh, internal movements of, of people, evidently. And uh, uh, so that, uh, will, uh, uh, that will be one of the positive aspects of, uh, of, uh, of a free trade area. The, uh, I'm not really worried about the uh, political, internal political consequences of migration. It's true that you know, there was that issue, South Africa, Nigeria, et cetera. But if we look at uh, 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 all the other uh, regions of a continent, if you take West Africa, for example, I mean, uh, the Nigerians in Ghana are more than 400,000. Uh, one third of uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast population comes from the region. And it hasn't really, I could give more cases, it hasn't really destabilized uh, socially uh, uh, these uh, African societies. So there is a, 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 a high level tolerance of migration, you know, as I see it. Uh, if you take Kenya and Al Shabaab, uh, so Somalians are quite an important uh, community in, in Kenya. And uh, the terrorist attacks of Al Shabaab in, in Kenya does not produce a retaliation of Kenyans vis a vis the Somali population, and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, migration, uh, uh, in, in my sense, I might be wrong, uh, is not, will not really uh, constitute a, a, a a social, a, a social problem, and it uh, it should be, as a matter of fact, enhanced within that agenda of the of the of the free trade um, uh, area. Uh, I, I fully agree with you, Professor, on the necessity to have a united African front in in, in order to uh, be careful in how we uh, manage the bilateral. Uh, we look at the bilateral trade agreements. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the, as you know, Africa is uh, in a negotiation process regarding the post-Cotonou uh, uh, agreements with, with Europe, uh, with the, in the context of economic partnership agreements among others. Uh, we, uh, we need to be careful to go with a uh, united front so that we don't have uh, differentiated regions uh, uh, negotiating on their own, because that will have a, a, a huge negative consequence on the uh, continental free trade area. So, so let me stop here and really th thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Mayaki and our discussants for that rich conversation. Um, and thank you all for hanging in. Um, uh, we know that this has been a really full discussion. We still have some time uh, to take a few questions. Um, and we have a microphone that uh, my colleague Alona will pass around. Um, my suggestion would be to collect a few questions and perhaps each person could introduce themselves briefly, keep their question or comment fairly short, and um, address the question either to the whole um, uh, panel or to one of our um, speakers in particular. Um, I think Daniel Sir Nayox has a, a question to start us. Yes. Um, <coughs> Merci beaucoup for your presentation. It was very interesting for us. Um, I'm the director of um, UN studies and international relations here at CEPA. And I have, so I first agree very much with you that the technical solutions, or often we call it technocratic solutions, are very limited. Um, though I would agree that a lot of the ideas that you have could be realigned with the SDG agenda. As a political scientist and somebody who is, um, in my professional capacity, less critical of the, multi or less, more optimistic about the multilateral um, 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 agenda um, and potential, I have a question about the feasibility, the actual how external actors, including the EU, including the UN and other actors, can actually promote what you say about inclusive development. 
or inclusive governance, because in the end, there are often political resistances of political elites who for very obvious self-interest reasons do not want to have inclusive governance. So the question is, how can then external actors such as yourself and others help these countries and societies and governance systems to actually promote inclusivity? And for what uh, populations, because sometimes there are minorities and others who are on purpose not included. Great, I think there's a question over here toward the window. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayaki, and thank you for the distinguished uh, respondent. I have a, actually a comment and a uh, Could you introduce yourself question. briefly? David Medihamam, I'm the director of the Office of Special Advisor on Africa uh, from the UN. Uh, Dr. Mayaki, I have a question. It's actually a clarification. Is the, basically, how to reconcile the localizations and the regional approach? Mm -hmm. If you look at what's happening in Europe, they wanted to drive more the approach on the regional side. And that fact led to eventually a boomerang calling further for localization. And that, as a de facto, you have more now populist governments and more people questioning the establishment because they draw more on the regional approach and forgetting about the local approach. So how to reconcile it? Because sometimes it's very difficult how to get yeah. all the locals, but at the same time converging to one position that would be at regional level, given the historical and also what we have currently in other parts of the world. My other comment, or at least uh, question, is despite the fact that capacity building is lacking among the youth, and they can be strengthening it. There is an important issue is how to get the data, how to get the information, and how to be able to have well formulated, well informed, documented position in order to be presenting their own perspective and own views. And sometimes transparency can be missing. So if they are the counterpart of the government or any public entities, they need to have, I would say, they have the same level of information and the same um, level of understanding, which is sometimes missing in, in some countries. Then my last, at least, comment. You said that the new leadership, there'll be in leadership, new leadership, provided that the life expectancy of our leaders would be shorter than some of them who just passed away a few years, a few months, or weeks ago. True that there'll be change. In Tunisia it happened, in Zimbabwe it happened. But it's only the leader that has changed. The system, as in other countries, for example, Algeria, uh, the, government, the, the leader has left, but the establishment or the system the, that is well established mm -hmm. in the country, the parties, the political parties, has remained the same. So that's a question. Mm -hmm. Leadership, yes, but it has to be at the grassroots, and it has to be really a much more full-fledged change of regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. We have, let's see, a question in the very back, and we also have um, Kyle here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mayaki, and to the discussants, Professor Norman, uh, Professor Archibong, for your lively discussion. Uh, I'm, my name is Kyle Donto. I am a board member of SPAN, in fact, and I'm a second year student here at SIPA. And my question has to uh, relate to urbanization. Um, and in African context, because what you have in Africa is a pattern of urbanization that is actually quite distinct from the patterns of urbanization that you've had in East Asia, in Europe, and even Latin America, in which, uh, as opposed to being centers for uh, manufacturing and centers for um, high value added services, you what you is just, is essentially have a, what is a process of agglomeration without transformation. You have people who are moving to the cities uh, to find work, but the only work they are engaged in is very low value added service work. And so you, you end up, what you end up having are these massive 10 million plus um, mega cities like Lagos, like Kinshasa, like Cairo even, uh, that aren't really major centers um, for outbound trade aside from being uh, transshipment points uh, for goods coming in from the highlands, uh, from the hinterlands, and headed out to uh, destinations abroad. So my question is then, in this context, 
uh, what can we do and what is being done and how do African government states, individuals, organizations cope with increasing and continued accelerating urbanization without necessarily this base of uh, manufacturing, for instance, uh, employment that other uh, states and other countries could have relied on in the past? And what is the new model that uh, for Africa to uh, develop uh, in the context of urbanization? Thank you. Great. And I think we have the one last question from the very back of the room. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Sonia Butler. I'm with the African World Heritage Fund. I am interested in to Dr. Miyake, the Excuse question me, could of... You keep, just keep the mic a little away from sorry, me. Sorry, sorry. Um, so my name is Sana Butler. I'm with the African World Heritage Fund. I am interested in the conversation of justice development. You spoke earlier this week regarding the SDG number 16, talking about the illicit financial flow out of Africa, and um, made a very masterful conversation saying that um, I think the quote, Let's, let us not forget that um, colonialism was the, a, um, a, uh, a fully fledged yeah, system of illicit financial flow. My, so my, here's my question. Is there a intentional and purposeful next step to the conversation of revisiting those contracts made during colonialism, recognizing, I think you said, 75% of the illicit financial flow is from the extracting industries. And is there, and if so, is there a, um, a, uh, a, uh, a committee of the willing, right, to, to a coalition of the willing um, to address and litigate uh, that charge. Thank you very much. Uh, Wide-ranging questions. Um, I'll leave it to anyone on the panel to respond to any of the questions you would particularly like to address. Do I address it to you? Okay. The regarding inclusivity. Uh, one of the best approximative indicator to inclusivity is uh, really job creation. Uh, decent jobs, as we are always saying. Uh, um, I, I, I think that uh, the more decent jobs are created, uh, the more inclusivity uh, exists. Um, uh, in quantitative terms. Huh? So, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, means that um, the way, uh, in a certain economy, the rent is managed uh, uh, does benefit to a minority or to a majority. So, uh, uh, when jobs are not really created, generally, uh, the benefit of a management of the rent goes to a minority, so it's we, we have a non-inclusive society. So I, 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 I think that indicator for me is a, is a, is a fundamental one. So uh, how much does a government uh, spurs uh, an inducive environment for the creation of small and medium enterprises, which are generally uh, managed, created, and managed by young people is uh, is uh, fundamental. Uh, how much uh, does the government uh, facilitates uh, uh, the creation of uh, uh, SMEs incubation centers? Uh, how much does it protect uh, uh, um, uh, the? Uh, intellectual property uh, so that it is not hoovered huh? uh, by, you know, uh, creating the necessary uh, environment uh, for uh, uh, youngsters who are uh, promoting and managing small and medium enterprises. All these uh, concrete factors uh, illustrate uh, uh, inclusivity. 
We, uh, now, if we move to the more political factors, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, budgetary issues, you know, we, uh, uh, the, the budget is uh, really the skeleton of any strategy. Uh, and many times you have uh, uh, the skeleton, the, the budgets uh, are going one way and the development strategies are going the other way. Uh, so uh, the best way to look at inclusivity is also to carefully analyze what is the content of the budgets that uh, governments do put on the table and how this budget, uh, uh, how far have this budget been the object of consultation. In a, in a country like Mauritius, uh, the day, uh, the, the day of the uh, parliamentary discussion on budget, uh, nobody is in the street. Everybody is in front of its CV. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you, you can find out. Which shows that uh, in, in a country like Mauritius, uh, the, the level of uh, uh, literacy regarding uh, uh, the issues of budget management are quite high. So uh, why people are in front of their TVs looking at the budgetary discussions? Because they want to know how much will go in X, Y, Z sectors. So then you can sense also a certain degree of inclusivity. So I, I think there are quite concrete indicators that can show us if in inclusivity exists or, or, or doesn't exist. And in other countries, I mean, the, uh, the knowledge of the budget itself is, uh, I, mean, I mean, nobody cares about what the budget is uh, because uh, uh, most people know that the budget doesn't reflect what are in the, the speeches regarding the development of a country. So uh, that could be my, 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 my answer. Hmm? on uh, localization versus uh, regional dimension. Uh, you gave the case of Europe, but if we take Europe, for example, and if we take the German model, the German model is based on the Landers, uh, and uh, uh, the, the Landers have more power than the central government. And they are the ones who have been the driving force behind uh, 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 the growth of the German model. So localization, the local dimension of development has been instrumental in making, in, in uh, bringing Germany to where it is today. Uh, if you, still in Europe, uh, if you take the case of, uh, of France, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the neglect of the local communities uh, has created a rejection of the central government, uh, which uh, populists like Le Pen take advantage of in order to build their, their discourse. So uh, I, I don't think it's uh, local versus regional. I think it's the way, first of all, uh, uh, national governments do take into account, and then I come back to the issue of territorial dimension, huh? uh, and uh, if it is uh, uh, seriously taken into account, uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the conflict local versus regional is, uh, is, uh, is, is weakened. Now, if we go back to the African uh, context, uh, why the reinforcement of a local dimension is important? Because if I take Boko Haram in Nigeria and Niger, fundamentally we know that the regions where Boko Haram did expand were regions where, that were neglected locally. Uh, and uh, the state was not present. So uh, reinvesting the local level can allow uh, a, a higher efficiency of a state nationally 
and can prevent regional conflicts because Boko Haram is affecting the south of north of Nigeria, south of Niger, uh, uh, Chad, and, uh, and, and Cameroon. And my thesis is that, uh, very humbly, uh, the two fundamental triggers of change uh, in terms of governance in the continent will come through an empowerment of local communities and uh, the definition of regional solutions. So uh, I, I see the African state as uh, globally uh, shifting its role uh, to a more uh, uh, modest role focused on creating inducing environments rather than dictating top-down strategies with a higher uh, capacity uh, at local level and a higher capacity at regional level. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I, the future will tell, but that's how I, 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 I see it. Now, there is a question on, uh, ah yes, the, the leadership. Um, um, what you were saying is, in the case of, for example, Tunisia or other cases, <coughs> the top leadership disappeared, but the system did. Uh, but I think it's a it's a question of uh, what does it take for any type of social change uh, uh, to happen, and afterwards be sustainable in terms of transformation of the, of, of the, of the systems. Uh, it has happened in Tunisia. It will reopen in Egypt. Uh, it, it has happened in Sudan. Uh, uh, it has, it's, it's, we are in live stream here, yeah? Okay. <laughs> 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 huh? So uh, it, it has happened in, it is happening in Algeria. Uh, so I think these movements of uh, uh, change uh, will amplify. Uh, they, they will amplify because of the demographic, uh, of the demographic challenge that we are, we, we, we are facing. So it is, it's the responsibility of the governments uh, uh, to adapt, to anticipate and uh, to avoid uh, situations where they, at, at the end, we, they, they, have to, they have to let go. Uh, we, nobody thought that in Sudan it was, um, a change could take place. And the case of Sudan is interesting because it's, uh, uh, the, the <coughs> leadership itself uh, has been, the way the new leadership has been confirmed, composed, uh, is, is quite original. And uh, uh, an interesting factor is that the new composition of the leadership has several years to go. So they have the latitude to induce the necessary changes within, within the system. But I, I, I agree that the sustainability of the change will what goes beyond just changing the, uh, the, 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 the leader. Uh, on the issue of uh, urbanization, uh, you, do you know the city of Onitsha? Nigeria. Uh -huh. How many millions? Eight. No, eight. You see, the, the urbanization, there is a, an urbanization process which is taking place, which is not fully known with the development of uh, middle cities. Uh, 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 middle cities, it's a pilot term, but uh, you understand what I mean. The development of uh, 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 intermediate cities, uh, uh, the landscape anteriorly uh, was fundamentally 
uh, rural villages and then big cities. Now, between the rural villages and the big cities, you have uh, a whole span of intermediary cities. And that's the, the way urbanization, and that urbanization process is not fully captured yet in uh, our uh, uh, policy uh, uh, design processes. It's, it means that uh, when we think about territorial planning, uh, we need to integrate that new uh, process of urbanization and integrate the Onichas, which are not really, uh, how many people know Onicha here? Eight million inhabitants. Uh, it's, a, it's an important city. Huh? Uh, 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 so there is a change in terms of urbanization uh, uh, which has to be captured uh, because it will have evidently uh, economic uh, implications are, 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 uh, are you are rightly uh, saying. So when we refer to uh, rural economic diversification, uh, no policy in terms of rural economic diversification can be efficient if it doesn't take into account the uh, uh, that context of uh, urbanization which is now taking place in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the continent. So it's, uh, uh, and I, I didn't refer to urbanization in my, in my talk, but uh, ur urbanization is going at a, at a very, the, the rate of urbanization is, 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 is very high. Uh, and uh, uh, by the UN says that by 2050, 50, 55, half of Africa's population will be in rural, in urban areas, and uh, that will uh, uh, really uh, create a situation uh, that we need specific uh, policies. And then again, it, it, is, uh, uh, it, it will have an impact in the way the government systems are, 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 are framed. Mm -hmm. So it's, we are no longer in a situation <coughs> where uh, we were facing a ruralization of urban areas. We are in a situation where there is an increased uh, number of intermediary cities. I don't know if I answered all the questions. I think I, there was I, one on ex I, illicit I tried, financial flows. I, I don't know if you'd like to touch on that. It was uh, uh, someone who had attended your one of your uh, other events. No, but this urbanization question, which and this Lalit McDonald, she's one of the things. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also uh, take this opportunity to do some commercials, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and. The, one of the issues we do talk about is urbanization too in this volume which is just published, The Quality of Growth in Africa, mm -hmm. which just came out actually last month. Okay. So I'll present oh, thank you. you. Thank you very much. For your thank you. <laughs> and that talks about the employment okay. issues, mm. the issues, many of the okay. kind of issues that you okay. touched on. Thank you very much. And, uh, I will need uh, <laughs> okay. If uh, um, I don't know, I Linda, just like to yeah. take the other please? one. Um, please. So the, uh, on the, uh, ah, yeah. I think, do you want to take her? Uh, yeah, on, yeah, very briefly, I, no, when I referred to the fact that colonialism was a fully fledged system of illicit financial flows, um, no, it's, uh, <laughs> theoretically, it can be defended, uh, but uh, it was not, in the sense that you know we should open negotiations for reparation, I, I think we would personally. I think we would lose time into that. That's my opinion. Uh, but, uh, but it's an opinion. Hmm? Yeah, I think we better focus on uh, how the. Uh, I, I don't know. The World Bank says uh, 50, 60 billion dollars of illicit financial flows, and two thirds are commercial. And in the two firms which are commercial, fundamentally it's mining companies not paying their taxes. I think we should 
better focus on our capacity uh, uh, to have to impose our tax system and avoid corruption in that domain than looking at you know potential discussion on reparations and so on. Uh, except if it is to invoke uh, a moral imperative. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I w you have covered, you know, a lot. So I, I, I think I have a different opinion, but, okay. but, but uh, we will we will what, fight about what it. What do you have a different opinion? Uh, about? about I have a different opinion on the reparations okay. issue. Okay. I mean, I do work in economic history, partly okay. on on looking at domestic labor coercion in colonial Africa, mm -hmm. and part of it is measuring, you know, the share of domestic labor coercion in mm -hmm. British colonial revenues and expenditures, and basically making the case mm -hmm. that African labor and African taxes funded a lot of, not just within country co infrastructure, but also mm -hmm. European infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's my, no, you know, no. my, my plug for, for that work. And, and yeah. of course, you know, thinking about the conversation about reparations that's happening uh, in the United States as well. Um, and I think a lot of former colonies are also bringing this up as a, mm -hmm. as a, as a, a, moral, a moral imperative maybe, or justice claim for redistribution. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, yes, I, I will leave it at that, and, and we won't argue here. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to learn on the work you're doing. <laughs> well, this has been such a wonderful learning opportunity for all of us, and I want to thank um, NEPAD, um, and Dr. Mayaki, his wonderful team that collaborated with us, all of our co-sponsors, um, our wonderful discussants, and all of you for um, sharing this time with us, um, and thank you again to Dr. Mayaki in particular for spurring our interest. Thank you.